Hello, Avian King here. Um, this will be the beginning of the creature design with Avian King series, and we will be covering Cerishian slash Avian creatures and characters. Uh, as a specialty, uh, I think this will be helpful for people who don't usually do birds or dinosaurs in their art. I've noticed with the well, not necessarily DeviantArt, but with the fur, I guess it could also be a way to develop fursonas to a certain extent. Not too seriously, but a way to go about avian creature design that doesn't just involve putting a chicken head on a muscle dude. So, to begin, we will be researching well no we will be brainstorming i already know what i'm going to design but i want to give you the viewer a chance to figure out what you want to design okay so let's begin for starters what is it that you would like to design keep in mind we're working with avians but the same question could be applied to any other creature or character design you want to do. So what do you want to design? Why do you want to design it? What do you want it to do? And what other creatures do the same thing? Uh, so I will be doing... I will be working more on plume beasts. Uh, if you watched the previous video, you know what a plume beast is. I gave like a brief analysis. Um, plume beasts are just a set of upright standing Cerishian aviale well, those are that's redundant Sir, uh, aviale um, closely well branched off from the I have a cladogram I will just show you the cladogram this got uh, snipped and written over to get the Plume beasts uh, written down, and this is this right here is just it from the chart. Like if I hand hand drew it, so we have Aviale, and we have a branch chain to Jailor and a Spellor and Plume beasts. And there you go. In in short, so knowing that we are, you don't have to know what branch or creature comes from just yet, but it'd be helpful. Or not what branch, what clad, or yeah, what clad what class of animal is it? So we know this. So my creature will be plume beasts. I know what they want. What I want them to do be the replacement for mankind because the is it the KT? The extinction of the Mesozoic and uh, Mesozoic Cretaceous. I believe the Jurassic never took place. So this planet's being run by uh, dinosaurs, essentially. So this is still Earth. The project is called um, Paraguay. Copyright. Um, so we know this. So now we know what we're designing, assuming you know. So I'm going to put out little, little branches. Let's say you want to design a... set of iguana, turtles, swamate, shellidon, stuff like that, who, that would take the niche, the niche of mosasaurs, that's not terribly difficult, because they're not turtles, but lizards are related to mosasaurs to a certain extent, specifically chochars and monitor lizards. So that's not too difficult, that'd just basically be a bunch of modifications to the existing anatomy if you're going down a realistic route. So let's say we took, if you want the first thing to do this morning, take a monitor, I don't do a lot of lizards. Let's 
sketchy shit art. I probably drew the no posts. No, I may, I may have drawn the pelvis wrong. Thinking about crocodiles, which are the closest thing to a dinosaur aside from birds, and in fact, they are pretty close to birds. Okay. Oh, well, we have a generic mo uh, monitor lizard. One fact about me: I love monitor lizards. My favorite one is the roughneck. Okay, so here's the generic model. Those are just the basic skeleton and what have you. <clears throat> if we want to turn that into a Mosasaur, Elasmosaur, place or whatever the hell you want, it does basically be. And that can stay the same because you need a one that snacks fish. The body is pretty long. Models are very good swimmers, as is. Tail can be flatter. Limbs could be reduced, even the hind limbs. In fact, they could just be paddles in the back. And if you want to go down a route of just making it look cool, nice dorsal fin. In fact, they found that Mosasaurus may not have had a dorsal fin or instead had a bend it down a little bit. A fluke. So there's the tail the way it bends. And then jetting portion. And it's not it's not angled in the way it would be in a whale. It's angled more like a tuna. So it's a motion like that and that's I don't know why I went on this tangent but it's basically for things simple as that that's all you would really need to do and then go from there but what we're doing here will be a little more complex as we'll be working with making them do a lot of the things that humans can do and more because we want that expression we want the dexterity that we have in this character and you things like mammals you can also create that but birds have a very different way of doing things anatomy-wise and behavior-wise that we can take to our advantage. So I, we decided what we're going to do, why we want to do it, and now we'll do structures and function, which I kind of delved into with the little doodle I just did. So let's talk a little bit about bird anatomy. I have some dissections here that I can show you. I have my manual of ornithology beside me because I do not know all the muscles by heart. I know a lot of the bones, however. Um, and I have my brain. So let's do a simple skeleton because I feel like to do any creature, especially if it's a tetrapod, if it's a tetrapod, you want to know what's inside the bones, the muscles, because that will create your form. That will really make your creature look alive. So let me find my... Okay, so let's try. No bird in particular. And I don't draw my skeletons too detailed. Unless I'm working on angles. And then I have like a mental map usually after doing studies. Another thing that's going to be a good thing to take note of, do a lot of studies, like watch online dissections, watch some documentaries, Google skeletons for the animals you're researching so you know exactly what's underneath. And if you can't find that exact animal, find its closest cousin or relative. So if you can't find the skeleton of a bird of paradise, look up a jay or raven because it's related birds both passerines both corvidae so you can work from there and the same with if you can't find a african badger you can just use the you can use a martin 
or the American Badger and kind of tweak it, maybe match the two influences, and you'll get a basic idea of what's underneath. They're both musculids, so forth, so on. You'll, you, you get the picture. So here is a... It's probably angled a little wrong in the spine, but... I need a book. I missed that book. I, it's so close that I didn't get it. Um, so here is a basic bird spine. And this is called the Paga style. And it's what holds the tail feathers. And these are the caudal vertebrae and all the other vertebrae. For birds, everything after about here is fused up until the, the Paga style. And it's fused into their pelvis. I I found a pelvis the other day at my canal. It was too badly decayed to, to bother bringing home. But I do have a couple of other bones that I was able to get from that experience. So we have a pelvis. And the shape of the pelvis is a key factor in how large of an egg this animal will be laying. So we have the codule vertebrae. Cods. Spelled that wrong. The pelvis. Right here we have the hole for the actual leg. And a... I get, technically, it's a Cerestrian pelvis. I don't know why they, in the beginning of all the nonsense, they decided to call ornithop um, yeah, ornithopod pelvises ornithischian, even though they have nothing to do with birds. They didn't go into birds. They didn't evolve into birds. And a recent chart came out. It's not going... It's not kosher, I'm going to say. Because they need more evidence to say this, but they were going to put sauropods and prosauropods in their own branch based on pelvis and put the saurischians, excluding sauropods and prosauropods, with the ornithopods for the sake of pelvis. They need more evidence. They're not sure. I wouldn't jump on that bag wagon just yet if I were you. That's too short. Something that's very interesting for birds is the femur is very, very short in comparison with the tibia tarsus, or tibia, whatever you sort of like to call it. And that can be seen in, I have a skeleton that's very interesting to show you, and it's from a fulmar, which is a type of seabird. Procellara forms. I got it off of a site that I forgot the name of because I found it on accident. Okay. Here is a Fulmar skeleton. Find the best one for. Yeah, here we go. So when you think of Fulmar, it's basically just a very small albatross and it doesn't do the same sort of soaring really. Um, where's my writing option? I don't have it right now. I think you can follow my cursor, probably. Okay, so here we have the tibia, long as hell. The femur, like two times shorter. And then you have the tibio, no, the tarsometatarsis, and the metatarsals, metatarsals. And then we have the wing and so forth and whatnot. And that will be interesting to know for the plumbies. Back to business. So we have Tibby Tarsus. Make sure I'm recording. That would suck tick if I wasn't. Okay. Tarso, metatarsals, metatarsus, and in 
a lot of dinosaurs, the running theropods, these were separate. These were separated and delved into each other and they fused with time for the sake of saving weight. A lot of birds have, most, no, all birds have the same bones that we have, if not more in some cases, because they have way more vertebrae than us. I believe a sparrow has 14 vertebrae, if not, um, neck vertebrae, if not more, um, and we only have seven. But a lot of these bones are fused, such as those in the pelvis fused, the actual pelvis fused, the skull, a lot of the bones fused, the ribs, not necessarily fused, but either flattened or very much reduced. This is the ilium. You don't need to know all of these bones for any creature design, really. You just need to know the shape and how they go together. Because that's what's going to be influencing a lot of your stuff. And they are not flat. So here's the pelvis looking from above. There'd be all. And you can, if you ever pick up a, next time you clean a chicken, and you take out the pelvis, look underneath it, because then you can see how the vertebrae have fused. I, to a certain extent, you could compare it to a turtle, how the vertebrae have fused and branched out. So that's just looking from above. At the pelvis and the caudal vertebrae. Okay, and now we will do, this is the scalpula. Or shoulder blade. In birds it is very much narrower. And this, and up on the back, and that will allow the bird to move its wings completely vertically and per, uh, is it perpendicular? Perpendicular to the body or the horizon line of the bird. I don't know if, wait, yeah, I'm not sure if bats can do that because I don't study bats. Here we have the, is it the furcula? No, it's the coracoid, corticordies. And they are, I don't know what they're called in humans. I used to know. I probably knew earlier this morning and forgot. So there's the coracoides. And there's a groove right here where they slide neatly in place. And here is the furcula, or we call it a wishbone, or a clavicle. Oh, I dangled all that nonsense wrong. Okay, that's going to see the same. Okay, so there's that. <clears throat> and right here, there's a groove right there where the actual bone for the wind comes in. And, okay, so just like us, they have a sternum. But there is a branching sailboat structure known as a keel or carina. And that's what gives birds their deep chest look. And this anchors all of the muscles for flight. I probably over exaggerate that thing, that length right there. And the actual muscles for flight, I don't care if I can draw this right. Split it in half so I save my time. Alright, draw it in a different color. Red. The actual muscles for flight are anchored below the wing, so it's a pulley system. There's one that pulls from the top, 
There's one that pulls from below. Or multiple. I didn't pay attention, even when I'm trying to learn. And they anchor to the wing from below, from below the body. It's a pulley system. This one pulls up, and these muscles pull down. Saving space on the top of the bird and directing their center of gravity to their downwards, not up. So, I think you get the gist of what's happening. Alright, I'm not sure. Cover that bit. Now, how are the bones connected to the actual body? Flying bird, the sternum is very large, and as will be the furcula and coracoideus. This skeleton's looking vaguely like a bustard, but it's not. I don't know. It's generic. So we have keel. The Okay, now we will cover the ribs. You can just call them ribs. They are ribs and they will forever be ribs. And they do have a process that keeps them out, layered over each other. Called the uracate process, but it's not important. Like, literally just draw the ribs. And strangely enough, the sternum of Hoatzins juts forward for whatever reason. I do have a picture on here and I will show you. It's very odd. Should have skeleton. Yeah, that's uh, rather peculiar, don't you think? And these birds aren't the best flyers. They are very labored in flight, and they do have a factor that will be used in the plume bees, where they have a gene. They are not as primitive as you would think. The most primitive groups of birds are the paleonaths, which would be ostriches, emus, kiwis, and titamaus, and the paleoanthocernes. Which is ducks and chickens and those related birds. But this bird, even though not related, even though not very primitive, has developed wing claws in chicks used for climbing. And the wing claw would be here and here. Ducks and chickens also have wing claws, but they do not appear to be as well developed as they are in the Watsons. refer back to that. Oh, well, I guess we should also cover muscles, shouldn't we? Not terribly important, but we could. Oh, well, we could also try drive a dinosaur pelvis. I'm going to draw a dinosaur pelvis for those who... Well, not necessarily dinosaur pelvis. A cerician pelvis. A basic cerician pelvis. will attach right up here. I it depends on what dinosaur you're looking at. Let me draw one that I saw the other day. And they're paired. So there's a bit there and there's a bit there. And it's hollow down the center. For eggs and feces and what have you. This is the pubis. A pubic bone, 
and this is the Ishium. And they come in a variety. A Ornithian pelvis from an Ornithian dinosaur would look like this, or like this. A Saurischian pelvis can look like this, or the reverse of this. So now we know all that, we have gone very far, so we'll put a new one and we'll do something else. So now we get to know the muscles, not surely all the names of the muscles, but we, oh I should have drawn a bird skull as well, well we'll cover that eventually. We need to know the, the muscles. Just the under the under format, this is what gives the birds their other shapes aside from the feathers and the bones. And when you draw these things, it will make it look so much more realistic. I'm gonna go in my book now and find the muscle section because I do not know the names, but I do know their shapes. So Okay, I do have the dissections on my computer as well, so I'll get those. If you're squeamish, do something else. Personal dissection. Okay, I own birds. I cover this last one. They do die, and this is what I get to do after. Okay, so we're going to. I want to spend all the basic muscles. Very short and nubbin tail. Tell up here, so. This is all soft tissue. And if you know the pelvis, you can draw the legs. It's gonna be a generic chicken or gala answer Long to be a basis. Oh, that's something I didn't cover. Wing bones. Through all the bones of a bird, they are, well most, if not all, are connected to air sacs. So they are hollow and they are light. And they, the whole respiratory system of a bird is very interesting and very much more efficient than our own. hand of a bird. And here's their thumb. So birds possess a thumb, an index, and a, well what was, a middle finger. And here is their radius. And here is their ulna. And those are too small. Get out of here. Get out of here. Ooh. 
Okay. Scale. Go too big. Maybe free to form. There's the calloused little muscles that close off the, the other end of the belt. Here we have the humerus. And in a dinosaur, depending on which one you're looking at, if you're looking at a, a fairly advanced theropod or a yellow, you will have the hold thumb. Bird hands do not pronate, they cannot do this. They are forever held in a clapping position, so like, the palms face each other. Always. That applies to birds now. I don't know how well I made that clear in the plume beast anatomy. And all I'm doing here is a lot of what you should be doing when you design your characters if you're going down a realistic route. So here are the step in, step in of a there plug. If it's possessed all five, it's something like this. I got the digits you go through. And these digits are clawless and sometimes have too many digits or very little digits, and it's just a cartilaginous process. And as I discussed in the last video where I kind of made like a little rant on the gent who told, said that birds can't dance just because of hand structure. And his theory was that this digit was lost and this digit was lost. No. Wait, let me look. Thumb was there. You did this and this. Yeah, this and this. His theory was this and this was gone. And he is entirely incorrect. Why would you get rid of these two digits when you're using these? These. But don't you need these? That you kept one? Why would you alternate which digits you lost and leave gaps in your hand? That's not how. I don't understand. When would that have happened? So anyway, incorrect, but here we go. There's basic Arcsorian Shershian hand. And the same applies to a crocodile. Crocodile hand. Apparently some geckos, I was told this. Crocodile hand. 
the study digits and lines two on Qualis. And if you want to quote me on that, go get a picture of Clark Valley and just see what I saw. Okay. So I had to make sure we covered that before I proceeded. Let me just save this. Uh, save this. Session or bones slash processes. Oh, there's a slash in it. That's fine. Okay, back to the bird muscles. So we know the hand. Don't need to draw that every time, but you yeah. know these basic things that we can go from here. Scapula. <coughs> the bones of the head. I'll draw a basic bird skeleton later. Okay. When you draw a theropod, dinosaur, a um, humanity raptor, theropod, whatever you want to call it, you draw one of those later on, and you do and have a long bony tail and all that. It's the same rule applies, but you can look at crocodile musculature for the tail, and keep yeah, it's basically all you need, and maybe for the jaws, but same for birds. Okay, here we go. So you have the pectoral muscles. That's all I'm gonna call them because pectorals. You have the legs. And this is gonna be the biggest muscle in the legs. This one right here. I'm gonna anchor up here. The smaller one the ankles to the angles to the lower end of the pelvis. One that go ankles here. And there's very little muscle in the bird's actual ankles and tarsal metatarsals. It's mostly, if not entirely, tendons. And they have a lot of calves, thick calves. I do have a very good picture of. Legs. Or bird leg muscles. I'm assuming the shining bits are just the leading portions of tendons here and here, and everything else is actual muscle. And here's the pelvis from above, as you can see, it's a boxy angular shape. There's all the muscles on the back, pretty similar to our own. There we go. Okay. I'm just gonna block out the basic muscles. Everything for me. Okay. So the big muscle I told you about that ankles to the angles and curse anchors to the knee. Smaller one below. Big calves, which ankle to the anchor, ankle, ankle to the ang uh, ankle. Let me look at my book for the name of this motion. Tibial anterior. And a lot of tendons, like a lot of tendons.
That was just a bone. You know, so it did. Get out of here. Okay. There you go. As for the shape of the actual foot underneath the skin, because there's a process here that if you don't know what it is, you think it's kind of weird. So, leg bone, little leg bone, and there's this, which will either be shaped like that in birds or dinosaurs, or like this where it's just future the body. And that's what gives chickens a kind of a weird ankle look. That's something you should know. As for the wings, I don't know. Sure, our basic wing bones. We have the patagium, which I don't know if you want to classify as a muscle or a tendon, which gives the wings their shape, and there's one in the back too. I'm going to change slightly different shape green. Or the pagitagius extensor, rather. Okay, and. Well, we're going to the scapula, so I'm going to draw a scapula real quick. Really janky scapula. Okay. So we have... Hold on again. Well, that's no good. I must drop my greens on the ears. Bird wings, well, those of flying birds typically don't extend all the way as you may think. Because of the way the muscles connect to the wings or the uh, extensors. They're typically always bent in a V. Even a, if slightly. So if an, al an albatross wing would be like this. So they're bent in a V. Okay. For the extensors or patagias, patagium, have one there, one there. Okay. To some degree, one there. And for the actual muscles, you have a muscle anchoring to the radius. You have another muscle going to the elbow. Yeah, I'm gonna reduce the passing on that. Wait, did I say radius? No, it's radius. Um, some radial mu. Damn it. Some radial muscles. Give it some mass. Some ulnar muscles anchoring to the wing and to some extent the actual radius. I mean, um, ulnar. And there's not a lot of muscle to the actual hand, so that's not necessarily important. And you have a latissimus dorsi. All you really need to need. As far as the, the shape, and you have a small muscle there about that one, but I'm not going to count this too important. When you actually draw the bird, Search complete. So we have learned 
a bit about bones, a bit about musculature, why we're doing this, and let me draw a little skull. So I guess that's important to every creature. Yeah, that's an important creature in suit. And as you can probably infer, bird muscles vary by species. Bird skulls vary by species. And bird muscles, how big things are, how small things are, also vary by species. That's cool. Stuff. And a side note bird tongues have a bone. I forgot what the name of it is. I think it's Google it. A hyoid apparatus. How they have a tongue to have a bird. So we have a bird. A lot of birds, ducks and parrots, I know can do this, and pigeons, are capable of cranial kinesis. Got a little, little cheap bone. Cranial kinesis is where there is a joint here. These move forward. And the beak can actually, to a certain extent, flex up. Free of the lower jaw or any other bone in the jaw. I mean, the lower jaw. Moving. It's interesting. I'm, if you have a parrot, you can observe this behavior. And you probably already know that they have this. So, there we go. Birds have the largest eyes in comparison to skull of the vertebrates or the land at least the land vertebrates and the ostriches hold ostrich holds the largest eye of any land animal big old orbits lower jaw it's a basic bird skull I don't feel like drawing the dinosaur skull or the squamate skull, so I will pull those up for you. Take some time. You can pause this section and uh, low, uh, mark them. Holes in the skull here, here. There should be one here, but it's not a squam. It's not a so an archosaur, so it won't have one, are, oh, in here, are called fenestras. Let me find a dinosaur skull. Uh, here are some crocodiles, and they have the same fenestras that a bird has. These are, okay. Here's the fenestras, uh, anorbitals, fenestra, orbital cinemestra, I don't remember the name of that one. Mandibular fenestra and nasal passage. They have the same pelvis. Well, yeah, very much similar pelvis to a theropod. Just direct to it a little bit more back. It's cool. That one doesn't help me. There's an oviraptor. You can see the pelvis. The hand shape directed inwards. The hand uh, facing the wind. The orbits. Actually, I should find out the name of orbit by looking at the. Oh, here's a spinosaur. I need to figure out what the name of that orbit is. Okay, all the orbits. Spoons. And the skull of a plume beast will be more or less. I've drawn it before. Nope, not even close. Hmm. I should have something that resembles it to some extent. To some extent, they resemble dromaeosaurs, but the dentition is different in Plumbees. They either lack most of their teeth or have fused most of their teeth. But have kept the keratin tipped 
Mac, uh, pre-Mac Solar and Lower Mandible. We have to build the structures then, and whatever else we can delve into in a future video. And that there concludes the beginning of the creature design with Avian King uh, series. Thank you for watching. We will be back shortly.